Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on what part of the world you're in and you're joining us from today. Thank you so much for joining the uh, Caldor Center Conference 2020 panel this evening, Facing the Fights Ahead, Advancing Protection at the New Frontiers. It's going to be a really fantastic and I think incredibly enlightening conversation, one that I am incredibly humbled and, and proud to be facilitating. If I wasn't here chairing the conversation, I would absolutely be listening in because I cannot wait to hear from the amazing lineup of speakers we have. Um, and just before we kick things off, I'd like to give an acknowledgement of country. I'm on Wurundjeri land, uh, part of the Kula Nations, and I'd like to pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. And my name is Osman Faruqi. I'm a journalist. I work for Schwartz Media, which is a Melbourne-based media company. I'm the editor of their daily news podcast, 7am. And prior to that, I worked at the ABC uh, with their flagship audio documentary program, Background Briefing. And my actual bio that I was sort of reading from has a lot of other long, boring things, but it's not uh, that important. Our speakers are far more important than my own uh, career background. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a really fantastic panel. But before I get into describing them and kicking off the session with a couple of questions, I thought it was worth reflecting on what we're here to talk about. It's obviously been such an extraordinary year in so many ways. And I know that can sound like a cliche, but I think it is worth repeating because there are so many areas that warrant scrutiny and critique in the era of the pandemic that often get missed when it comes to the big picture media conversations. And it you know, really is such a critical time to think about issues like human rights in particular. And we've sort of seen this fascinating contrast between solidarity and collective action shown by communities wanting to work together to overcome the odds. But we've also seen extraordinary attacks on civil rights and liberties. And some of those have just been an acceleration of what we've been seeing for the past few decades. At the same time, you know, inst trust in institutions, whether that's government, the police, the justice system, the media are declining and we have more polarization and a more fractured media and political environment ever before. And so I guess tonight, we're here to sort of discuss how we can advance the discussion around human rights, particularly for those uh, including refugees amidst this kind of backdrop. And to help us discuss these topics, we've got Michael Ignatieff, who's the president and rector of the Central European University and was previously the Edward R. Morrow Chair of Press Politics and Public Policy at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. And prior to that, he served in the Canadian Parliament and was the leader of the Liberal Party. Thanks so much, Michael, for joining us. And alongside Michael, we have Gillian Treeks, who is the UNHCR's Assistant High Commissioner for Protection. Uh, she was appointed to that role in August last year. Uh, Gillian is a renowned expert in international law and has held an extraordinary number of eminent appointments in so many different roles, including most recently as the President of the Australian Human Rights Commission and the Vice Chancellor's Fellow and Emeritus, Emer Emeritus Professor at the University of Melbourne. And joining Gillian and Michael, I'm extremely proud to have Sultan, a Saudi Arabian journalist who is currently seeking asylum in Australia. And he has spoken out publicly about his experience of immigration detention and some of the particular policy issues that refugees have been facing in the last couple of years on the ABC's Radio National. So thank you again, Gillian, Michael and Sultan. Uh, the way that we'll host the event tonight is there'll be about 40 minutes of questions that I will frame to kind of cover off some of those key issues. And we'll have about 15 minutes of audience questions afterwards. There's a question and answer dialogue section within Zoom. So please feel free to ask questions as the discussion uh, goes on. And I'll just kick it off with my first question for Michael. And Michael, over the past few months, as I was alluding to in the introduction, we've seen you know, human rights, pitted in some instances against public health. But, you know, I think that's essentially a bit of a false binary, even though that's how it's been framed. But it has seen, you know, this, this fascinating situation where many on the progressive side of politics who generally are supportive around, you know, human rights discourse, 
they can act quite dismissively to those who've been protesting within it, you know, in Australia and in many places around the world, we've seen anti-lockdown protesters, for example, protesting under the rubric of rights who've been criticized by those on the left of politics. What do you think that says about the way we currently understand and debate rights? And do you think we're falling into a trap of dismissing the importance of rights as a framework as we survive the pandemic? Boy, um, I was expecting a, a nice quiet morning with my Australian friends and you, Osman, you've dumped me in a really difficult question right from the <laughs> beginning. Um, look, I'm, I'm, to be blunt, entirely unsympathetic to people parade um, um, demonstrating without masks because uh, I just think the, the evidence is in uh, and masks do prevent infection. Um, I think there is an entirely legitimate debate about how far uh, lockdown should proceed. There is a moment at which this does infringe rights of mobility, rights even rights of uh, free speech, rights to demonstrate, rights to mobilize. And I think human rights activists should, should always be uh, debating those issues. But I'm utterly unsympathetic to people who are saying, uh, wearing a mask is an infringement on my liberty. And the reason is that it's a demonstration of solidarity. It both protects yourself, but it appears to have uh, some real effect in protecting the strangers among whom we live. So I just think uh, we've, we've, got to, um, uh, we've got to distinguish between legitimate human rights concerns about infringements on um, rights to demonstrate, rights to speech, rights to contest and debate government actions with um, essentially an ideological attack on uh, mask wearing, for example, which I think is ideological. I don't think it's a defense of any right that I can understand as being valuable. So we need to be tough-minded and, and, and clear about that. But the, the larger issue here is that um, there are kind of two competing principles of legitimacy in a democracy. One of them is majority rule, and the other is knowledge. I mean, science. Uh, and they have always been in conflict. The majority often thinks, why should I listen to these damn scientists, these pointy-headed professors, people like me? Why, why, you know, why should I give them any authority? So there's an inherent conflict beneath the one we're having between majority rule and knowledge. And, and this is being fought out. And it's a tremendous strain for democracy. In many places, I think Australia is an example, judging from the Melbourne lockdown and other lockdowns that I read about from a distance, um, science, knowledge, and majority rule have worked together. They have been in harmony. Roughly the majority thinks, I got to listen to the scientists. But there are lots of places, and the United States is one of them, where in state after state after state, there's a violent conflict between knowledge and majority rule. And, and this is the kind of issue a democracy has to solve. Now, there are other places in the world, like China, where that little problem doesn't arise. Frankly, I would rather be in a world where that problem does arise. That's what it means to be a liberal Democrat. So that's my thought on that issue. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, and a lot more things to unpack. I made a lot of notes to follow up on if we have time. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, Gillian, one of the one of the rights, I guess, that has been most under attack, even with perhaps the best of intentions, is the freedom of movement. And in June, uh, the UN Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres launched a report about COVID-19 and, and people on the move. And the report argued that the dual challenges of responding to the pandemic and protecting human rights of people on the move are not actually mutually exclusive. So with, with that in mind, how can travel restrictions, border controls and, and all these other public health responses that we've seen be sensitive to this, to this need to protect people? Well, thank you, um, uh, Osman, and that, that is exactly the point that we make and try to make uh, at uh, the UN Refugee Agency. And that is, it's not a binary issue. It's, it's one is, it doesn't exclude the other. But, but can I say as clearly as I can uh, that the United Nations clearly recognizes the sovereign responsibility, the duty 
of a state to protect its citizens in a context of a pandemic of this kind. There, there is clear obligation and, and, and responsibility to protect borders and to protect the population from a spreading, uh, rapidly spreading virus. But the point that we make is that uh, you can protect your borders, states can protect their borders and public health, but also respect the fundamental principles of human rights at a broad level, but most particularly of refugees and asylum seekers. Um, and perhaps it's an appropriate point to mention that this is the, we're just coming up to the 70th anniversary of the Refugee Convention. Um, it was designed at the end of the end of the Second World War or six years after the war when there were about two million people still displaced and needing to be able to, to find protection uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, in another country. Um, that was the purpose of the Refugee Convention and there were two principles. One is that uh, everyone has the right to, to, to seek asylum and the other is that no one ever can be returned to a place of danger and persecution. Now, those principles worked, um, and they have worked in the international community for a very long time. But now we're in a, in, a, in a very challenging environment. We have something like 80 million people now uh, forcibly displaced either within their own country or across national boundaries. And we have a national, oh, and we have a global pandemic. So we've really got an unprecedented challenge to those fundamental principles of international law uh, and and to um, and and to and to stability in in attempting to meet these uh, these uh, demands. So um, what we what we say and what we argue is that you can protect borders, but you can also ensure that those who are in need of protection also have access to asylum. Now that sounds perhaps abstract. You say, well, okay, well, how do you do it uh, when you've got people at the border pushing against that border? Uh, potentially with the, pan with, with the virus. And the answer is that some countries have shown uh, that you can, um, you can use remote te technologies, you can use quarantine processes. Uh, there are all sorts of mechanisms that can now be used to ensure that people retain that right of access to asylum. Uh, at the height uh, of, the, of the pandemic, 168 countries closed their borders and 90 uh, rejected any capacity to claim asylum at all. So the consequences have been very serious. Um, but perhaps if I could finish by giving one example of where this, the, the, as you began by saying, you can do both. Here we had Uganda just a few uh, months ago, which, is, which hosts 1.4 million refugees, uh, having left for the most part from the Dominican Republic um, of, uh, of um, uh, the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, Nonetheless, the Ugandans opened their borders to more refugees, another 3,000, and ensured that they had access to asylum. And they did so in a way that protected the community against, against the pandemic. So, so that is really, it's, it's doable, but it depends on political will. Thank you. And that's a fascinating uh, example that I feel like has really flown under the radar in so much of the conversation. So thank you um, so much for sharing that and, and making that point. Um, Sultan, as, as a Saudi journalist, you know, you have your own experiences of, of living in a country well known for its policies on, on human rights and, and the press. But, you know, you've said that it was only when you arrived in Australia as an asylum seeker that you found yourself in handcuffs. And, and I think the the story of, you know, your story and the stories of so many people seeking asylum what I think they do is they shatter this illusion that a lot of Australians have. They, you know, they think of us as a country that respects human rights. They don't really think of Australia as a country that regularly abuses them. But I'm wondering if from your perspective, you might be able to share how Australia does compare to the countries we do decry as human rights abusers and, and why you think there might be an unwillingness to acknowledge that from Australians. Um. <clears throat> Saudi Arabia is is a place that is like none other uh, in the world in, in so many ways, um, and it's become even more stringent in some ways, a more 
far more liberal in many, many other ways since uh, King Salman came into power and Mohammed bin Salman, the, the crown prince, came into power. Uh, for many years, I was able to work as a journalist in Saudi Arabia without any troubles, but it's only over the last three years that things changed um, in many good ways and many bad ways. Women have been liberated as far as driving is uh, concerned. The guardian system, uh, guardianship system is slowly being chiseled away. Um, women are more involved now in government, more involved in the workplace. So many things have improved. But when it comes to journalism and journalistic freedoms, um, especially after the brutal murder of Jamal Khashoggi, um, the environment there became intolerable, um, especially you know being in the news media and working with the foreign media. Um, the part about coming to Australia, um, I was forced into that due to some troubles I had back in the kingdom. And I've always looked at Australia and thought of it as a place that is the bastion of freedom. Uh, my father was a sailor. He sailed around the world back in the 80s, and he stopped in Cairns for a brief uh, period of time. And my father told me that Australia is a lot like America, uh, but uh, sorry to my American friends, but with much better people. Um, and that's what I expected. Now, I grew up in the States. I never really had any problems over there until after 9-11, uh, being a Saudi man in 9 uh, after 9-11, it was just not a smart thing to, to be there. And I ran into some problems as well that I don't want to get into. Um, but coming to Australia, um, for me, I remember the moment when Canada declined my partner a, a visa simply because he didn't have much of a travel history in his passport. And we were stuck in Cairo. And my partner, through a quick internet search, uh, managed uh, to find out that Australia in issues instant tourist visas to uh, to people, uh, to Saudis. So in that aspect, that facility allowed for us to come to Australia um, thinking that we would be met with, uh, with open arms. And unfortunately, that was not the case. Um, we did research Australia a little bit before coming here as far as refugees and asylum seekers that there was not much that was written out and you know out in the international media or out in the world about what actually happens to to people seeking asylum. The only thing we read was that if you come by boat, you're never going to be settled in Australia and you're going to face a long detention. But we came with valid tourist visas that were issued that we paid for. Um, and to come to the airport and seek asylum, to have our visa canceled and then effectively be made as illegals in Australia was something I did not even think would happen. I thought, you know, when I spoke to the ABF and told them, I want to apply for asylum, they're going to give me a brochure, um, tell me, you know, contact these attorneys. There's an Australian asylum seeker center that you can speak to. None of that. Um, we ended up having our phones taken away. They looked through our phones. Um, they made us unlock our phones so that they would have the access. And then um, they uh, they proceeded, like I said, to cancel our visas and uh, placed us in a holding cell at the airport here in Sydney. And uh, we were kept there about seven or eight hours between all the questioning and the processing and all that. Um, I did not expect that from Australia at all. We spent, my partner and I, two and a half months in immigration detention. And uh, through a lot of media attention that we got through friends of mine in the media and people sympathetic, the gay community, Senator Janet Rice, Human Rights for All, Alison Madison, all those people got involved. And we were the lucky ones. But I know for a fact that there are, asy are asylum seekers that remain immigra in immigration detention that have never committed a crime in Australia. And they remain there for years, three years, seven years. 10 years in the case of a young man who arrived here in his 20s. So that is something that I never expected would uh, would happen um, here in Australia. And it was shocking. It was unconscionable, you can say. Thank you um, for sharing your experience. And I think it's important to hear. I'm so proud to be on a platform where we can tell the stories of, of people like yourself first time, because I think I think a lot of Australians aren't quite aware how abnormal our approach to these things are, even beyond issues like offshore detention, mandatory detention. This, the way that we respond to people coming by plane and seeking asylum is so different to what happens in so many other parts of the world and what organisations like the UN and, and the agreements that we sign say should happen. Of um, course. Um, and to make it more relevant to COVID-19, um, the 
I remember when I was at Villawood Immigration Detention Center, the community visits that we used to have from people in different communities, from the gay community, those were such a boost to your um, to your confidence to that you're going to have a normal life at some point. But not knowing um, when you're going to get out was the worst part. But um, just to make it brief and quick, um, COVID-19, the biggest impact it had on people in immigration detention was first on their mental health, um, scared, worried, the lack of information. Um, but then stopping the visits um, was just something somewhat understandable. But until this time, I believe those visits are still not allowed to go on. So this tremendously affects people mental, people's mental health. Um, when is going to end? No one really knows. Um, and that's the thing about immigration detention is you really are not given true and accurate information. And COVID-19, of course, is adding to the stresses. Yeah, no, and thank you um, again. And, and Michael, I might um, come back to you on, on this question as well. You know, you've argued previously that when the, when the discourse around refugee rights, when, when, when we talk about admitting refugees to our countries, is framed around compassion, which I guess is very appealing to a lot of activists and campaigners. You argue that that frame actually shifts the conversation away from a language and conversation around rights and our obligations uh, and, and makes it more about compassion. But, but with COVID having, I guess, entrenched nationalism and closed national borders to this extent, how do we how do we change tack? How does the, the language of rights gain traction again? You know, one thing that I'm quite anxious about is the fact that, you know, now that border closures have become the status quo in so many parts of the world, including here in Australia, the fight back against that, you know, means it'll be even harder to argue for a rights-based immigration system. Another great question. It's just a reference back to what uh, Sultan was saying. I, I, I don't want to get Australia off the hook, but I would have to say that there's a lot of immigration detention in Canada and Britain and France. And I'm talking to you from Vienna. I expect there's some immigration detention in Vienna that isn't so terrific. Um, there is a disturbing sense in which um, uh, immigration detention remains uh, to some degree in many countries kind of outside of the legal world. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a discretionary world that is not very um, carefully guarded and there's some, there's some problems there, serious problems there. So I, I, I just think Sultan's point is generalizable to a lot of places. Um, and uh, that, that would be the, 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 the first thing. I mean, look, we're, we're in a world where um, there's no doubt uh, uh, Refugee and asylum are now global phenomenon. Um, the Western Mediterranean, as Jillian will know, is just full daily of pontoon boats. The Eastern Mediterranean, from Turkey to Greece, full of pontoon boats. Um, uh, everywhere in the world, I think Jillian used the, their 80 million internally displaced and externally. That's a lot of people, and a lot of people on the move. Um, so we have a global phenomenon that is coming up against another global phenomenon, which is the renationalization of national space. Um, it was a shock to me as someone who's lived in Europe a lot to see that the minute COVID happened, the 27 countries of the European Union, that border, borderless paradise we celebrated, suddenly shut their borders literally. You know, in a in a 24-hour period, um, COVID renationalized uh, um, border sovereignty in a way that I think was entirely unexpected in um, in Europe. If you go to Canada, um, I'm a Canadian. Uh, there was a border that was the largest unpoliced border in the world. We used to think, and the flow across that border was a lifeline for both sides. And now it's shut. And if you poll Canadians, 80% of them want to keep it shut. Uh, this is completely unexpected. Uh, I'd never expected to see that in my lifetime. And yet, if I was in Canada, frankly, with the way in which COVID's been handled on the other side of the border, I would be in support of keeping it closed. So this is the world we're in, a global migration push with a renationalization of borders, and therefore, inevitably, enormous strain on 
the principles that Jillian and UNHCR and other great agencies try to defend. That is the principles of the 1951 convention, which is, which are not based on generosity. They're not based on compassion. They're based on rights and prudence. I mean, the, the, the 1951 convention was built because people thought as an international security issue, it was a very, very bad idea to have a lot of people banging on the door, getting into countries and not being able to get in. And if you allow a personal sidebar, I am the son and grandson of refugees. I mean, my, my father and my grandfather came to Canada as refugees. They were on what used to be called a Nansen passport. Um, way, this belongs to the history of refugee protection. So we've had a 20th century, which has tried to put in place international mechanisms to make sure that refugees do have a right. But that international system is, let's also be honest about it, being overwhelmed by a flood of what are easily described as economic migrants, as people who really don't fit the international language of, of the convention, but are just desperate for a, a better life. Uh, they're escaping intolerable condition, conditions if they're men, uh, if, they're, if they're gay men, if they're women, if they're poor, uh, if they're members of persecuted minorities. So people are just flooding out of countries in trouble. Um, and uh, this is the situation we're having a great deal of trouble uh, dealing with it. The one thing I would conclude, however, is that this, it's not merely a matter as, as Jillian would say, of, of enhancing international legal protections for refugees. It's also the much more difficult question of sustaining any degree of political support inside these countries for a refugee protection program that admits people every year in a steady stream. Um, and, and that political support has more or less collapsed. If you look at the United States, which used to be a leader in refugee protection, they're taken, unless I'm much mistaken, almost no one in, in, in refugee protection in the last year. This, you can say this is you know, a phenomenon of the Trump presidency and it will change with the Biden presidency, not so sure. The political support for refugee protection is, uh, is, is very seriously damaged. And the one thing I would say, a kind of negative point to conclude, is that it, we're not going to rebuild the refugee consensus in favor of refugee protection by denouncing everybody who doesn't want to take any more refugees as racists or you know, nationalists or reactionaries or conservatives. Um, there are a lot of decent, generous people who think kind of, we can't deal with this now. We got COVID. My kid's unemployed. Uh, I'm worried. I'm I'm stressed. I'm threatened. So, rebuilding that consensus is very difficult and will not get anywhere. We simply denounce everybody who opposes international refugee pr protection as belonging to you know the devil. That just won't get us anywhere politically. What will get us somewhere, I think, is just saying, listen, it is in the long-term international security interests of every country to admit regularly vetted, cleared refugees consistent with that convention. It has been worked for 70 years. There's no reason why it can't keep working. Uh, that, that narrowly focused appeal, I think, will have uh, some traction. But let's be frank, we've got a real problem of sustaining this entire regime. Sorry to go on so long. Uh, no, thank you. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, and, and, and Jillian, you know, I guess staying on this on this theme of, of borders, COVID nineteen is obviously, as as Michael was just laying out, has really exacerbated this challenge of, of offering protection right around the world. But you know, is there is there some glimmer of hope? Has the pandemic you know, maybe created new opportunities or perhaps elevated voices in this space that we previously haven't been paying enough attention to? Well, well thank you. Uh, thank you, Osman, and, and thank you um, to Sultan and, and to Michael. Uh, before I answer your question precisely, or more precisely, can I perhaps pick up on a point that Sultan made in a way that that resonates with people? Um, because I tend to, you know, speak about the law and, and abstract ideas but, but Salter makes the point 
that how important visitors are at Villawood. I know Villawood very well. I've been there many times. It's a despairing place. But the visitors made a difference. And when a country closes down those opportunities, my concern is that we will find it very, very hard to build back better, to, to use the words of the Secretary General. And this is really the point that Michael's making, that we're, it's going to be very difficult to go back or to resume from where we left off when, when COVID subsides, as it surely must. The, the, the problem is that we've lost that political support for these fundamental principles. And that's, that's a huge challenge. Uh, and, and that's the one that, that, uh, that, that we have to try to meet at the UN Refugee Agency. I'd like also, if I could just respond to a, po a point that Michael's making about the law. Um, I have appreciated the way he's talked about rights, and he does, of course. And that's what we talk about, human rights and the rights of refugees and asylum seekers. Um, but it, but I, equally, you can't really get very far uh, for me to talk about Article 9 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or the Article 1 of the Refugee Convention. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't attract the same kind of impulse or response. So uh, Michael's right. The, the protection space is shrinking. It's shrinking dramatically. And the political will, I wouldn't say that it's entirely collapsing. We have, it seems, a change of administration in the United States. I think we have some glimmers of hope. But the ones that I particularly wanted to talk to you about, Osman, in response to your question, is what has COVID done uh, to, in a way, open some opportunities that we haven't had before? And if I could just step back a little bit, um, you'll, you'll all remember that in 2018, the international community, 181 countries, agreed to the Global Compact on Refugees. And this was an astonishing agreement. It's not a legal agreement. It's not a treaty. It doesn't have to be ratified, etc. But what it does is adopt a single principle, essentially, and that is global responsibility sharing. But we can no longer tolerate a situation in which a country like Turkey has, ha has uh, hosted 4 million refugees for, for now 10 years, or Bangladesh hosting 850 Rohingyas from, from Myanmar or 100,000 Nicaraguans fleeing to largely uh, Costa Rica. Um, we have to share these responsibilities and the international community accepted that, that obligation. Now, no one could have imagined that when that agreement was, uh, when that um, agreement was made to those principles, uh, and we had, you might recall, a global uh, pledging conference last December with 1,400 pledges for sharing. No one could have imagined then in December last year that we would be where we are today, with, uh, with borders closed, denial of access to asylum, uh, and, and 1.3 million deaths uh, from COVID. Um, but what have we learned as a consequence? And one of the lessons we've learned is the enduring relevance of that compact. Now, it's not just theory. This is, this is really um, states agreeing that they will share this responsibility. Um, and, and that's really the principle that we have to operate on. Now, what have we seen in, in the context of COVID that, that COVID that gives me the sort of the optimism the op for the future? And one is uh, that we've seen a, um, and we've, we've been able at, at the UN Refugee Agency to operate at a much more local level. Um, we have all we've got 450 or so field offices throughout the world with UNHCR, something like uh, 17 more than 17,000 staff. Uh, we're able to operate with our partners at the local level. And this is, if we were operating uh, as, a, as, a, as a Geneva uh, headquarters uh, without those facilities, we wouldn't be able to do very much. But we've been able to work with local communities, faith-based groups, mayors, cities, um, uh, various NGOs, uh, in a way that, uh, that we haven't been able to before, partly because of the rise and the use of technology. So that, for example, um, uh, we have journalists in the, in the Sahel operating radio stations to provide information about, about COVID. Uh, we, we have a million bars of soap being delivered uh, into the Sahel region to Burkina Faso and Mali. We, UNHCR, the Refugee Agency, has been building shelters for Idlib, for people um, uh, uh, bombed by their, by their own government. Uh, it, it's been astonishing what's been achieved at the local level. And I think that that plus technology has given us an opportunity to, to respond to the, to the, to the COVID environment. Um, I think it's an extremely healthy in, 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 uh, context. 
and I think we can we can see um, the community groups of the kinds that I've described starting to to step up and to provide support where it's needed. Uh, we've seen huge social and economic impacts of the of the COVID-19, quite apart from the ones that we've been describing, border closures and so on. The, the, the big issue, frankly, for the next few years is going to be the economic and social impact on displaced people and refugees. Uh, they're the first to lose their jobs uh, and they have not always been included in health systems or social safety nets. It's a mixed picture, and I have to be fair in saying this, that overwhelmingly states have included refugee and, uh, and asylum seeker children in education. They have in the main, for very obvious and practical reasons, been included in, uh, in health systems. Um, but to, 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 to just uh, encapsulate that point, the key issue that we're concerned about now is inclusion of refugees and asylum seekers and responsibility sharing, all of which are to be found in the global compact. And I'd like to, 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 to finish, if I may, with, with perhaps not such a positive point, but to pick up on what Michael was saying about, about the Mediterranean and other parts of the world. Um, we're seeing something that, as an international lawyer, I never expect to see, and that is countries denying disembarkation to boats. And in the last few days, we've had scores of people dying, possibly larger numbers, because we don't always have the facts, but four boats uh, um, uh, going down, um, capsizing, with significant numbers of people dying, including children. Um, and this is now becoming almost a weekly, if not daily, event. Uh, now, we've seen it in the Mediterranean, we've seen it in the Andaman Sea, the, 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 the Bay of, of um, Biscay, but also now we're starting to see it up from the west coast of Africa uh, uh, through up into the Canary Islands, because people are desperate. And they're desperate in, in many ways. So we're seeing shocking denials of rescue at sea. We're seeing boats exploding. Uh, we're seeing countries denying disembarkation. We're seeing others, and I should mention this, uh, Indonesia took 300 Rohingya um, from a boat that been, had been drifting at sea for nearly six months with 30 mm -hmm. deaths uh, on board. Absolutely shocking stories that despite good journalists, uh, good uh, efforts to get this message across, it's still not really registering other than in, in, than in local areas. Well, there's so much I could say, so many points that, uh, that uh, Sultan and, and Michael have made, but I think I'd like to say it's a mixed picture and we have to use those local resources and technology uh, to reach remote communities, to reach people in desperation uh, and to, to try to, to respond to the humanitarian needs. Perhaps I'll finish, and I know I should be shorter than this. Um, I do agree with Michael. Uh, we have a legal foundation. We have fundamental principles. But we will probably succeed in, in implementing those if we emphasize for the future, if we build for the future by emphasizing humanitarian needs, by emphasizing the richnesses that, uh, that refugees can bring to our communities, uh, by the long-term need to include uh, those uh, displaced in our, in our national communities and sharing responsibilities. So I think that's, that, that's enough a long answer. I'm sorry for that, uh, 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 Osman. No, that is, that is totally fine. Thank you so much. And I understand that it is uh, an extremely complex area. I was hoping that, oh, wow, a positive note amidst all the things that we're talking about. But I think it's absolutely fair enough for you to point to some of the, the the harsher realities as well, but but I do think just just picking up on some of the points you're making, even if you know we can't, I, you know, it would be sort of foolish to describe these things as silver linings because the cloud is is so significant. But I think a lot of the stories you were telling, you you were telling us, really point to the fact that as challenging as this year has been, human resilience and our desire to support one another and build community has shone through, and there is, you know, our our job in some ways is people who have some privilege and, and relative luxuries to enable support and amplify that where we can. So I, I really appreciated um, that answer. Um, and just before I, I go to another question uh, to, to Sultan, I just wanted to remind the audience that, um, you know, please do ask some questions as a Q and A feed. I promise you I could ask our panels, panelists questions for the next three hours, but I would rather uh, give the audience an opportunity. So please um, jump in there if you can, and we'll get to that um, in just a few minutes. But um, Sultan, Gillian uh, made, made the point about journalists telling stories and how that is often a key part in how we understand what's happening around the world. And you know, you are 
a journalist by, by trade. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, with, with the, the extraordinary state of the world, with, with lockdowns, with border closures, travel restrictions, and increased powers for all sorts of agencies like police, security forces, the army, you know, how, how has COVID-19 impacted the ability of journalists to investigate particularly human rights issues? And, and you know, how have they perhaps adapted to those challenges? Um, it's been good and it's not been so good. Um, some of the challenges that we face are people are just uh, at home. Uh, we don't have that face-to-face -face interview. Um, we're not able to go out on the streets and uh, you know just talk to people and try to find out what issues are 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 foremost in their mind. Um, their people just tend to be uh, at home. Um, here in Australia, we seem to be going back to somewhat normal, uh, which puts us puts us in a very uh, env uh, enviable uh, position. Uh, but just how how it's it's impacted us and the job that we do. Um, we're very, very limited. I mean, we're having to redefine the way that we do things um, all over again. We also are seeing around the world, including here in Australia, attempts from governments to make it harder for stories to be told. And I think there's an interesting recent example of that. The Australian government's own attempt to ban mobile phones and immigration detention, which they said was an anti-crime measure, but obviously would have prevented detainees from not only speaking to family and their lawyers, but also to journalists. Do you think we're sort of facing a kind of a dual pincer uh, that, that's making it harder to tell these stories? Um, absolutely. I mean, taking away people's phones in immigration detention keeps them from reaching the media, reaching their families, reaching um, uh, NGOs that could possibly help. Um, when that was being considered uh, here in Australia, um, mental health cases actually increased significantly because not only do you have people that are cut off and not allowed to have visits, but they're now not going to be able to have the video chat with their children, with their wives, uh, with their husbands. Um, so, of course, that, that led to a lot of mental health issues. But for us um, as journalists, you know, COVID-19 is, is, is what has been the top item in the news since March. And a lot of stories are not getting told simply because of COVID-19. And again, you know, not being able to travel and go see the other places that refugees are fleeing to, of course, it limits what we can tell. Um, of course, now, if you didn't have the Internet and Internet access was cut off for refugees um, in Villawood or all across Australia, um, it would definitely uh, be uh, put more strain on mental health issues. I know that just a couple of weeks ago, almost three weeks ago here in one of the immigration detention centers, um, a gentleman put a, a tied a sheet around his neck and jumped off the balcony. Um, and that is not the first suicide case that has been seen in Australian detention. So with COVID-19 and everything, it's just adding a huge strain on the mental health of everybody, not just here in Australia, but I assume all around the world. Mm, yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, uh, that. That sort of, I guess, really sharp summary of where we're at. Um, we, we do have uh, a few questions that have come through from the audience that I'll, I'll turn to now, but um, would, yeah, just again, if anyone's got any thoughts or questions you'd like, please um, ask them. Um, this first question is from Martin Bibby, and I might I might um, ask you, Michael, in the first instance, but but you know, depending on time, I might ask the other panelists as well. And Martin Bibby asks: There are about sixty thousand Australians overseas waiting to be repatriated. And you might, if you're not aware of that context, that's uh, Australia because of its border shutdown and the way that we're doing quarantine, there are quite a few 60,000 Australians stuck overseas, unable to come back home. Martin says there's little hope of Australia accepting fresh refugees, I guess, before we deal with that crisis and before that everyone is treated with a vaccine. So once we potentially get to a point where borders might return back to normal, and even if we get a vaccine, what do you think we can do to get agreement that we can actually lift our refugee intake prior to pandemic levels. Do you think that is a possibility? And if so, how do we get there? I think your, the example you're raising uh, highlights one, one thing that I think is just a fact about the modern world and you can quarrel with it, but it's just a fact. Every national government gives priority to their nationals. Um, We've had a human rights universalism since 1945, of which 
the Refugee Convention is one example, but that universalism, that idea that we have rights, we have obligations to people who are strangers, obligations to people beyond our borders, obligations to people who are pressing to get in, those obligations are universal, but they, in a, in a political sense, always come after uh, prior obligations to uh, our national uh, communities. I think if anything, COVID-19 has strengthened that set of priorities and whatever you think about those priorities, universalism is always in a battle with particularism, with localism, with Australia first, with America first, with Canada first, with uh, Britain first. That's just the facts of the world. Um, I, don't, I don't mean to say by that that the battle is lost. I just think that since 1945, there have been these two competing principles at work organizing our moral priorities um, and uh, creating the political um, consensus to once, once we have a vaccine, once the borders open, to um, return to a certain kind of pragmatic universalism that says it's actually in our interest to have international obligations that we carry out. It's in our interest to take uh, refugees. Um, uh, you know, some of this depends on rebuilding narratives. Um, the narrative, uh, the Australian narrative of it being a country of immigration, the Canadian narrative of it being a country of immigration, the, the narrative that insists that in fact, uh, multiculturalism, pluralism um, has been terrific for these societies. Um, it's one of the great success stories of the second half of the 20th century that we are, we are much more plural in our origins, much more, we come from many places. Um, I don't think you can rebuild refugee protection unless you simultaneously build, rebuild a commitment to a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-confessional society. And that's a lot of work uh, because it faces resistance. And some of the resistance isn't racist. Some of the resistance is just, you know, I grew up in a certain kind of Australia and I don't, I'm not too comfy with the new Australia. But the new Australia is a fantastic success story. The new Canada is a fantastic success story. And rebuilding that national narrative that we are one people with many origins um, is, I think, key to rebuilding um, a principal commitment to refugee protection. Um, I know that the immigration stream and the refugee stream are different. I, I get all that, two, legal, two different legal streams. But in fact, in the politics of accepting strangers, it's one stream and it's one story and it's one narrative. So that, that's where I think we need to go. And I'm not altogether pessimistic about that. Um, I, I see that in fact, uh, in my country, Canada, uh, there's pretty resilient support for a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-confessional, multi-religious society. It, it's not, uh, people like it, it works. Um, you know, it, it's threatened, it's under, it, you know, it has to be fought for, but it's working. So if we get to a vaccine, if we get to a sense of safety, I think borders will begin to ease up. Immigration streams will begin to flow again. Refugee streams may begin to fl flow as well. Um, thank you, Michael. And look, I, I would actually um, like to hear the other panelists on this one, but I've been a victim of my own success in bullying the attendees to give questions. So we might move on uh, to, to another one. And um, one uh, for, for you, Gillian, um, from a questioner. I'm curious to hear what the speakers think of the EU's proposed migration pact as it would enable rights infringing digital border policing and signatory states to buy off their obligations to international refugee law. How does this add up to signs that the UNHCR and the EU seem to be increasingly working together? Yes, uh, I should. The, the pact is a is a um, very very important initiative uh, for the EU and the new uh, president of the uh, of the Commission and and the and the commissioners. Um, UNHCR supports the pact in its broad terms, uh, partly for. Um, partly for pragmatic, for pragmatic reasons. And that is that it's extremely difficult with 27 states to achieve a consensus. 
and we we uh, accept that there have to be compromises if you're going to achieve that consensus. If we can't, if that consensus cannot be achieved by the Commission, then we have we go back to the unilateralism, the nationalism, the populism. We go back to this world that Michael had never expected to see again, nor had I, of closed borders across Europe. Uh, so for that reason, I think we have to be uh, realistic in in, uh, in 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 seeing the the broad benefits of achieving a consensus around the pact as it's current broadly as it's currently phrased. Now, the the uh, the question, and thank you for the question. I'm really pleased that uh, that you're following this in Australia. Uh, there are elements to the um, the pact that that uh, we will be we are talking to the EU about. Um, uh, we do see the value of. Um, of use of remote technologies, of digital uh, processes, they can be enormously helpful, and they can help deal with backlogs of numbers uh, in in a way that's that's fair. Um, and we are concerned about some of the compromises over um, those states that do not or will not receive relocation, sharing, if you like, of of refugees. I've just been on mission, for example, in um, in Malta and in Greece and uh, um, in person, and a, a virtual mission in uh, in Cyprus. I'll be heading up into the Balkans and then across to the Canary Islands. I hope, but the we have to understand these are these are the frontline states, and they need to be supported. They cannot simply continue to receive thousands upon thousands of refugees without the support of fellow members of the of the European Commission, and that's what this. This pact is designed to achieve. If I can finish with just one quick point, and that is uh, the, um, the the point that's made in the pact, and we do support it, is those who are not in need of international protection under the refugee principles and under international humanitarian law must be returned, if it's possible, in safety and dignity. If we don't return, and one of the complaints that so many of the frontline countries have globally, but particularly in the Mediterranean, is that almost no one is ever returned. Far too many of them are detained, but they're almost never returned. And until we can get a proper return policy uh, back to countries of origin in safety, then that, that challenges the integrity of the entire asylum system. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. But there's a question that's been voted to the top that I wonder if we can get a, a quick response, maybe just a minute or two um, from everyone. Um, from Claire Powell. I wonder if the panelists could comment on the extent to which involving refugees themselves in decision making and policy formulation is under discussion in the forums they are engaged in. Absolutely fundamental. Uh, what, that's another thing we really learned through COVID. We must listen to the refugee voice. Uh, there are some wonderful women-led refugee voices, which are also important because the women are often at the front line of uh, responding to COVID, but also they are suffering uh, with their children from COVID, uh, particularly gender-based violence. Um, we also very strongly urge that refugees be included in peace settlements and negotiations to, to manage the refugee situation in their particular communities. It's crucial. So over to Michael. Uh all I would add is that uh, every policy is better when people participate. Uh, if you see refugees as the objects of a policy, you're going to have a bad policy. Uh, if you see refugees as rights bearers, as international citizens, as people who have claims that must be listened to, you'll get better policy. So I entirely agree with the idea of involvement and uh, this can happen in refugee camps it can happen in uh, you know we've got uh, we've got a refugee claimant on this panel that's the right way to do it so absolutely fantastic and and another question that i might go to each of you on to sort of round it out for us um and starting with you um, um sultan you know is the panel optimistic about human rights at this moment despite 70 plus million people voting for Donald Trump, the endurance of Orban and other populist and anti-human rights and anti-refugee leaders around the world. And I think, you know, it sort of gets to the heart of a lot of what we've been talking about now, this grapple of, of rights against a world um, where there's a resurging nationalist movement and a pandemic on top of that accelerating a lot of these things. 
how do how do we feel looking looking to the future, um, Sultan? It's hard to tell because I mean we don't know how this COVID nineteen thing is going to end. I mean. Due to COVID-19, so many changes are happening around the world. The so security borders now being erected in Europe, as has been said. Um, it's hard to tell. I mean, this is a whole new world that we're getting into. Um, so it's really, really, really hard to tell. But I, I, the point about including refugees in the conversation is very, very important. But unfortunately, refugees are dismissed all around the world. We're seen as people that are, you know, uh, in need, needy people, and we're often uh, dismissed. Um, so how it's going to change things remains to be seen. Um, but I am hopeful that, you know, somehow this will reunite the world, though I, I'm very, very doubtful. Um, but let me just say something that might actually, I hope I'm not critiqued for. Um, being now a refugee, um, people have referred to me as a former refugee. Now being in Australia and enjoying the relative safety from COVID-19 that the country has managed to, to um, um, enjoy, um, it leaves me worried that, you know, if we open up the borders, having been a refugee myself, if we do open up the borders to, to, to refugees now, what will happen? I think that's probably the, what's the, the, the main question that's on so many people's minds here in Australia and probably in every single country around the world. No, thank you for that. Um, we might go to you, uh, Michael, and then get Julian to finish it up. Well, I think when we get a vaccine, uh, we'll be less fearful. And when we're less fearful, we'll be more rights respecting and hopefully more generous and hopefully, hopefully wiser. Fear is a terrible teacher. Uh, so I hope we have a 2021 that is less fearful. And if that happens, then I'm much more optimistic. Thank you. I, I agree with, with that. I am optimistic uh, and I frankly think that there's no, no other option than to be optimistic. I think COVID has taught us a lot of lessons about globalization, about the importance of our multicultural environment, the importance of freedom of movement, uh, importance of humanity to people who need protection from, from conflict. And we're seeing that uh, even more so today with the, with the uh, eruption of civil and now international uh, conflict in, in Ethiopia, Sudan, Djibouti uh, and, uh, and Eritrea. Uh, I think that COVID has taught us that we can respond uh, to, to the humanitarian need. And I think that, that we will stand back uh, from this COVID virus and say, we can do this together. Uh, and including, of course, finding a virus and distributing that virus across the whole world so that everybody uh, in their turn uh, has access to that virus. So I think that that's probably the most optimistic point. Uh, but fundamentally, I think we need the political will uh, because we know we can do it. We know we can respond to these global problems. Uh, and I think maybe COVID has taught us that lesson. Thank you. Um, that is unfortunately all we have time for. Um, but thank you to our three panelists, Sultan, Gillian, and Michael, for sharing your time, your expertise, and, and your thoughts. It was extremely, extremely fascinating. And thank you so much again to all the attendees, and, and especially thank you to the Caldor Center for putting on this event and also the conference all day and asking me to chair. It was a real privilege.